Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining me for this edition of Telling Our Story in Prince George's County. I'm Council Chair Andrea Harrison, your host. Coming up, Prince George's County State's Attorney, Angela Osselbrooks, and later, Director of Housing and Community Development for Prince George's County, Eric Brown. Stay tuned, I'll return in just a moment with another edition of Telling Our Story in Prince George's County. My name's CJ. A few years ago, my father became seriously ill. I did what I could do before he passed, but it took its toll. I lost my job, my house. I'm getting back on my feet, but I don't know when there'll be food on the table. How'd I do, CJ? We could be twins. Well, cousins, maybe. <laughs> Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Welcome to Telling Our Story in Prince George's County, a production of the Prince George's County Council. Our story is about caring people and vibrant communities, our children, youth, and families, our great opportunities for culture, and our rich history. A wonderful place to visit, featuring our past, present, and a future full of promise. This is Telling Our Story in Prince George's County. Insight, knowledge, and perspective on the things that matter to us all with your host, Council Chair Andrea C. Harrison. Hello, and welcome to Telling Our Story in Prince George's County. This program is a production of the Prince George's County Council. I'm your host, Andrea Harrison, Council Chair. There are great things happening in Prince George's County every day. I believe that our success as a county depends in part on our ability to tell our own story. That's why we're here today, to share some of the great stories happening in Prince George's County. It is my privilege to introduce my first guest, Prince George's County State's Attorney, Angela Osselbrooks. We've heard so much about the tremendous progress in our State's Attorney's Office, and I know you have some great stories to share with our viewers. Welcome to Telling Our Story in Prince George's County. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. You know, you are the first woman elected State's Attorney for Prince George's County. Tell our viewers, first of all, what attracted you to uh, law and justice, and then why the state's attorney's office? You know what? I decided very early that I would be a lawyer. I, in fact, I decided um, maybe even before middle school, and it was based on my desire to fight for others. Uh, you know, I talk to students all the time about finding their gift, and for me, I have a gift of helping, um, but I also enjoy fighting for the rights of others, and I found that I could do this as a lawyer. Oh, wonderful. So, as the county's top prosecutors, what are some of your priorities? You know, violent crime, reducing violent crime is always a priority, and I believe we've been able to work really effectively with the police department, uh, especially over the last year, to see a decline there. But I am also equally committed to making sure that people don't come to us in the first place, and I believe that that really is the uh, duty of the chief prosecutor, is to make sure that there's a decline in gr crime uh, through intervention and prevention programs that help people to stay away from the judicial system. You have, um, I guess, a, a, you lead a staff um, of attorneys and others, about 90. There has been some concern about being able to retain those um, attorneys. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. You know, we, we prosecute about 40,000 cases per year, and we do so, uh, as you know, with 90 lawyers. And to give you some context for this, Baltimore has about the same amount of crime with 220 lawyers. Now, that means that we are understaffed, but we also pay less than most jurisdictions, and it's been a challenge. So I really, we're grateful um, to you and to the county council as well to the county executive who have really made this a priority for us. And we've seen a huge, uh, we were able to really be successful in not only um, increasing our positions, but we were also able to give some raises uh, to some of the attorneys who have been in our office for many years without, without increases. And those help us to retain them. Great. So um, what are some of the other um, avenues that you're looking at? Are there, is there anything else that you're looking at for uh, retention? 
Oh, absolutely. Training is always a, a great tool. One of the things about Prince George's County's uh, State's Attorney's Office is that we have a caseload that really rivals other jurisdictions, but that means that our attorneys have the absolute best experience, they have the best skills. We have some of the finest lawyers in the state. Uh, so there are a great number who like to come, who want to come to our office, but offering them training, I think, does that. We also do quite a bit in the office to work with morale, um, to get our attorneys involved in the community. They understand the work, they uh, value the work, and so even though the caseload is high, many of them really uh, enjoy it and, and stay. Um, because we're doing such wonderful training, um, I know that um, we lose some of them to other jurisdictions, but a number of them have actually been appointed to the bench. You want to talk about that? You know what? Prince George's County State's Attorney's Office is something to look at. We have so many uh, who go on to be appointed to the bench from our uh, office, and it, again, it is because we are able to track, attract some really high-quality lawyers. Not only that, but they have experience, really, that, um, that makes them well-suited for the bench, not only in terms of their legal expertise, but these are public servants who have worked with the community for many years, and they have the temperament, uh, they have the skill set, and they, f they make really great judges. Yes. Um, the number of things that you're doing, the commitment that you have, the, um, um, the need to reduce crime in our communities, you talked about some of the preventive uh, measures that we need to take. How do you see your office working to impact economic development? Because we all talk about economic development and how much we need to attract more commercial business for our tax base. Talk about how your office interacts or plays a role in that. You know, there is a link between public safety and economic development that is inextricable. There's no way really um, to consider them apart from each other. That safe communities attract businesses, we understand that, and so we make sure that we are not only firm in prosecuting cases and sending the message that crime is not tolerated in Prince George's County, but we make sure that we partner with businesses uh, where we can. We have Teen Court, for example, and have developed a, a wonderful relationship with Wegmans, uh, who find themselves also very interested in helping young people develop. So we are firm, we're fair, we try to make sure we're consistent as well in prosecuting cases and causing a decline in crime, but we reach out to businesses as well to say, we want to work with you. This is your uh, workforce that we are developing. Let's make sure that we find a way for our young people to be productive, and it's been very helpful. Another example is uh, we have prostitution around some businesses, uh, and, and the business owners came to us and said, this is a huge problem. We have community prosecutors who went out immediately, and I've since seen some of those business owners who said, you know what, they're gone they're gone, and that's the work that the prosecutors do. Also, just in our residential um, communities, we did have a major problem along the D.C. border, along Eastern Avenue, mm -hmm. and so we were able to uh, put a plug in. We were able to work together to come up with um, a piece of legislation to address that so that our residents also feel safe as it relates to prostitution and, you know, all of those activities that they don't want to wake up in the middle of the night and see when they look out their windows. They don't. <laughs> it affects our quality of life. Mm -hmm. We get it. I live here, you live here, mm -hmm. and we work hard. These businesses, we want them here. Mm -hmm. This is a, a business-friendly environment that we're creating, and we do it through effective uh, public safety. Speaking of public safety, and um, we've heard some wonderful statistics about the reduction in crime. You want to just talk about that a little bit? Um, absolutely. You know, we have had about a 44 percent reduction in homicide since last year. Uh, the chief of police tells us as well that uh, that they have been able to chart about a 5 percent reduction in crime uh, overall, and those numbers are on top of last year's reduction, which was about 12 percent overall, and the year before that we were at a 35-year low. So the police department, I have to give, a lot of credit. They have done a magnificent job. And then we receive those cases, and we're making sure that we have also uh, been prepared to prosecute them effectively to stop the recidivism that we're seeing by attacking violations of probation, going after repeat violent offenders, and we have been able to really be successful in bringing those numbers down. How do you think we maintain that? I mean, we've got to, the trend is wonderful, but how do we maintain it and, you know, and make it better? That's the perfect question. Thank you for letting me. <laughs> you know what? We can't do it without the community. Community input means everything, which means we need people to come to court as jurors. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you how many people I encounter who say, I got a jury summons and I'm going to avoid it. 
I want to make up an excuse not to come. We cannot be effective if our citizens do not get engaged. That means we need you to come. Please come when you're called for jury duty. If you hear a crime or you see something, please let us know. We've had shootings happen in apartment buildings where we have received zero phone calls. So please call us and stay engaged. So how are you working uh, to get witnesses to come forward and, and uh, get people to actually to understand the importance of being a juror? You know, that requires trust. And I understand that, that unless prosecutors get out of the courthouse and into these communities and, and build relationships with our community, it will never last. And so we've made a big effort through community prosecution uh, to get out to civic meetings and homeowner association meetings and picnics and such um, to develop relationships that are productive with the community. And we think we're going to see some great results as a result of that. Since you've been in office, you've uh, established some new departments or new units within the state's attorney's office. Talk about those a little bit. One is strategic investigations, and that goes in line with what I spoke about in terms of reducing recidivism among violent repeat offenders. So we partner with the Police Department's Special Investigation Division, and this is an offender-based approach to crime. So individuals who have very high offender scores, uh, people that we see in and out of the system who are involved primarily in rings of crime, uh, for example, gang crime. We have prosecutors who are specially trained to, um, to handle those cases in very effective ways. Uh, for example, Fort Washington, we had about 35 burglars. We were able to zero in to make an arrest there. We came in, uh, we were able to have them cooperate, and we solved a number of crimes, even from that one offender, and that's the work of strategic investigations. Uh, we have the collateral unit. When I talked about violations of probation, what we noticed is there are a number of people who are in and out, in and out of our system. Mm -hmm. They violate their probation and nothing happens. Well, we are proactive in going after those individuals to make sure we're requesting backup time so they don't have an opportunity to reoffend and to harm another person in our community. And those are two of the units. Um, what about crimes against elderly people? Um, credit card fraud. Talk a little bit about those because those um, affect a number of our residents as well. You know, and, and thank you because that gives me a chance to talk about a third unit I created called Sp Special Prosecution. Mm -hmm. We handle elder abuse, which is a growing uh, crime in our community, which just makes us shudder. Uh, we have so many seniors now who are not only the victim of violent crime, uh, but who have been also the victims of economic crimes. And about 70% of them are victimized by their own families. Uh, this brings about a great amount of shame, and so they don't report it. Mm -hmm. So we have prosecutors. We participated just last week at the mall at Prince George's um, in a fair that would give information to seniors and, and ask them to please contact us. Uh, so we've, we've been working there in, in economic crimes, in, including mortgage fraud. Uh, we have an award-winning division. Uh, we've been recognized by the state of Maryland for the effective prosecutions that we've had against people who are predatory lenders and others who have taken advantage uh, through mortgage fraud. Um, Talk about, can you just give me a, a few examples of some of the economic crimes against our seniors so that um, our viewers will have an idea of what to look for? There was a very um, disturbing story last year. There was an, uh, an elder in our community who had a man come to her and he said he was a Christian and he would show up at her house periodically and she unfortunately was suffering from some dementia. He had her sign checks um, against the equity in her home, telling her constantly that she was going to lose her home unless she uh, provided these checks that he was going to somehow solve a problem that he detected with her home. And, um, and because she suffered from the dementia, she didn't remember writing the checks. So she wrote, um, I believe, about $130,000 um, worth of checks to him, impacting, of course, her retirement savings and everything. And he defrauded her. And that's the kind of crimes that we have seen uh, against elders, but primarily at the hands of relatives. So as we move forward in um, trying to bring about community trust and, and reduce crime, I think you have a couple of things that may be coming up, and one of them in the fall called a Sisterhood Summit. Let's talk about that and, and some of the other collaborations that you have. I am so excited about the Sisterhood Summit, and this summit attracts women between the ages of 13 and 18, and we're going to also have a summit that will uh, be geared toward college-age women. But what we're finding is that the women are in great need. Uh, that the violence among them is really very disturbing. I'm hearing from school officials that they're having trouble um, dealing with this population. So we 
have now the school system, the faith community, uh, we have any number of mental health organizations who will be present on September 29th um, to receive these young women and provide resources to them. We have mentors who have already uh, been prepared to come and receive the women to help them after the summit. We'll be talking about topics of interest to them, including um, social media. We'll talk about self-esteem. We'll talk about resolving conflicts non-violently. So we want them all to come. We also have a series for the parents, how to parent a teenager, and also darkness to light, how to recognize signs of sexual abuse, which is also a huge issue in our community. And so we'll have a dual track, one for parents and one for the teens, and we want them to please come and join us September 29th. You know, we may have to have more discussion about that because we didn't have an opportunity to talk about domestic violence, and which that leads right into. But I do want to thank you so much for coming to join us today and for your continued commitment to public safety. Um, I appreciate your efforts and I look forward to great initiatives that you have planned and for the future. It's been my pleasure to have you as my guest on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's time for a short break. Director of Housing and Community Development Eric Brown joins me when Telling Our Story in Prince George's County returns in just a moment. In 1977, in Johannesburg, South Africa, an eight-year-old boy picked up the game of golf from his father. By the age of nine, he was already out playing him. The odds of this gentle lad winning the Junior World Golf Championships at the age of 14, one in 16 million. The odds of that same boy then making it to the US and European Pro Golf Tours, one in seven million. The odds of the Big Easy winning the Open Championship once and the US Open Championship twice, one in 780 million. The odds of this professional golfer having a child diagnosed with autism, one in 110. Ernie Els encourages you to learn the signs of autism at autismspeaks.org. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. Welcome back to Telling Our Story in Prince George's County, a production of the Prince George's County Council. I'm Council Chair Andrea Harrison and I'm your host. Joining me for this segment of Telling Our Story in Prince George's County is the Director of Housing and Community Development for Prince George's County, Eric Brown. Welcome to Telling Our Story in Prince George's County. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Good. So you have extensive experience in government and housing um, from places such as Mississippi and New Orleans and then even as close as Baltimore and Annapolis. How have those experiences helped you in doing the job here in Prince George's County? It's helped in a number of different ways. First of all, it, uh, it allowed me to be able to come in and, and start right away uh, repairing relationships and building credibility with the partners such as HUD and developers. So it's been very, very helpful uh, and, and prepared me very well for the task at hand. You know, everyone knows that we're tackling a serious problem here in Prince George's County and that's the issue of foreclosure. Um, there was a recent mortgage settlement um, that uh, had an impact on Maryland and Prince George's County. Can you explain what that is and what does it mean for the residents of Prince George's County? Sure. This was a, um, a, a settlement between the 48 to 49, actually 49 of the 50 states, uh, where the Attorney General sued the, the five top, lar the largest uh, mortgage service companies. And as part of that settlement, uh, there were um, specific things that they must be able to do. One is to be able to work on principal reduction uh, for the mortgage holders 
I mean, the mortgages, the people who actually pay, pay the mortgages. And then the other thing is that the, in some cases, people who had already been foreclosed upon, there's an opportunity for them to be able to get a small amount of money somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,000. But with respect to the state and Prince George's County in particular, the, the Attorney General has about $60 million that, it, it, that is his discretion as to how it is to be used. He formed a group and asked them to give him advice as to how that money should be spent. And I was fortunate enough to be a part of that work group. With respect to our county, $10 million is coming to this county. And we intend to use it as part of an overall strategy for stabilizing neighborhoods, specifically those communities that have been hardest hit with the foreclosure crisis. The state has identified what they call top hot, stop, hot spots. And then we're targeting at least five hot spots so that we will be able to go in buy up houses, renovate them, and then to be able to either sell the houses to new, new home buyers or people who might be there to be able to find a way to either lease it back to them or just rent it to them until they're able to get back on their feet. The idea is to be able to stabilize a neighborhood. Our belief is that if you can save a home in a neighborhood, you, you're able to save the entire neighborhood because values will come up and then you don't have vacant and blighted conditions in that community. Before we move on to uh, uh, new home buyer programs, let's talk a little bit about some of the foreclosure pro programs that the, we have here in the county um, for our viewers. Um, I know that a number of us get calls about, is there any assistance available? What can the county do to help me in this particular matter? Can you just talk about some of the programs that sure. foreclosure, either prevention or whatever the foreclosure programs sure. are? From our perspective, what we do is we, first of all, if a person is experiencing or going through the process of being foreclosed upon, we try to get them to a housing counselor as quickly as possible. So there's a person on our staff that's dedicated to that, and that's Nicole Gary. And they can reach Nicole at 301-883-5531. Uh, yeah, you know you said that number too fast. You <laughs> had to say it again. I have to say it. I have to slow <laughs> down. <laughs> uh, the number is 301-883-5531. Five five three one, and Nicole Garrett is the person that works with it. But in addition to the housing counseling, uh, we work with um, banks. We do outreach, uh, working with other nonprofits, uh, the, minister, the ministers in the community. All of those, as much outreach as we can, to be able to make sure that people know that they can get help. Um, you just had a housing fair a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Um, there were bank servicers who were there and homeowners had an opportunity to speak with them. Do you have any other events that are planned? The, the, there's a number of, at least two uh, outreach efforts that are coming up. One, uh, Councilman Patterson will be having one on June 30th. And then um, Congresswoman Donna Edwards will be having one, I think, is uh, the middle of July. I believe it's July the 12th. All of that is part of outreach, getting the message out to people, letting them know. The biggest problem that we found with people facing foreclosure is one admitting that they are at that point and then to be able to to get help. Um, the state has a hotline. Uh, you can go to the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development and go to their website and, and their HOPE program and they can also be, help as well. You talked a little earlier about um, some of the um, about the neighborhood stabilization efforts and um, being able to provide individuals, particularly first time, first time home buyers, um, with assistance. Um, can you talk about some of those uh, some of the programs? Can you go into a little bit more detail sure. about that? Sure. The first time home buyers program, we provided down payment assistance and closing costs. So if they, those are the things that a family need in order to be able to make that that purchase, the first time home buyers, they have to be within a certain income level to be able to do that. Uh, we also ask that they provide some of the assistance. If they got money that liquid assets that is at least $3,000 or more, we ask that they contribute anything above that, that they are able to be able to help 
uh, get in the home. But we're very active in that. Uh, we had 33 zip codes that we've been working in. Uh, we just recently launched a, a program in the Suitland area, and because Suitland has been hard hit by foreclosure, and we believe that you know concentrating in areas can also make a difference. So those are some of the things that we're doing to attract foreclosure. So families with limited incomes, mm -hmm. they, um, they qualify for this. Uh, are there other programs that um, families with limited incomes can participate in? Sure. Uh, yes, the, with, with respect to the, the, the first time home buyers, the, even though they may have limited income, they have to be able to qualify and be able to pay the mortgage. But in addition to that, some of the other things we have is like we know that from time to time there are people who are elderly and frail and they have a hard time making their home repairs. So we have a single family um, rehab program to help families as long as they own their homes. There's not a lot of debt on it. We can work with them and we do, we do. the maximum amount of money that they, they can qualify for is $30,000. But it makes a difference if in terms of bringing it in up to code. We also have another program that's called a weatherization program. Doesn't cost anybody anything, but if they qualify, and primarily elderly or people who have children in the house that may be disabled and under the age of five, then we work with them to make their homes more energy efficient so that they'll be able to save money during the winter as well as the summer. It's hot now, and everybody want to run the air conditioner, but if you got an energy efficient home, then you're able to save some. So our weatherization program helps with that as well. You also have um, in DHCD um, housing choice program, um, also known as Section 8 housing. Mm -hmm. um, talk about how that program works, because there are people who say, I've been trying to get, I've been on the waiting list for five years, and then I know a few years ago it opened up for 30 days and another 5,000 people attempted to apply. Talk a little bit about, um, about that program and how it works. Sure. The Housing Choice Voucher Program is one where the Housing Authority will issue a voucher to an eligible family. That family can then take that voucher and go to the private sector and uh, get a, an apartment. It's a very popular program, particularly because people have an opportunity to move about. Now, one of the things that we often hear is that people who are on the voucher program, that they create problems in the neighborhood. Well, we need people to know that if there are in anyone that they believe is a, is, a, is a voucher holder, they can contact our office. And if we find out that the person is not living up to their responsibility, then one of the things we can do is terminate their assistance, and we are very, very forceful about that because the program is a good program. Many of the people, and I say the vast majority of the people who have vouchers are people who are good law-abiding people who want to have a safe place for themselves and their family. Another issue that we hear about along those lines are those individuals um, who um, have made their homes available. Uh, so it may be a single family home or town home or whatever. Um, I know that there are requirements, um, state, federal requirements, but what we'll hear oftentimes is that there may be a voucher holder who's staying in there, the landlord is absentee, the property is run down, um, they can't find, they can't make the, the folks who are in there clean it up, cut the grass, make the repairs or whatever. Can you address that a little bit sure. and tell our, our viewers, you know, what they can do? Sure. If, if they find that they have this kind of problem, they can contact our office. And here's what we do. We follow up. If somebody contacts us about a complaint, we have inspectors. And there are certain standards that the property owner must maintain in order to stay on the program. First, we warn them that here's the problem. You need to address it. We give them a certain period of time in which to do that. A failure to do that, then two things happen. The first thing is we stop payment until they are able to make the correction. If they fail to make the correction then, then we will then move the family out of the program. So in essence, we have two things. One, where we deal with the person who has the voucher and they're not performing what they're supposed to do. The second is the landlord. If they're not doing what they're supposed to do, then the idea is to get both of them, either one, whichever one is, is causing a problem, off of the program as quickly as possible. 
We have about 30 seconds left, but I want to try to get in. The uh, county executive has a Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative, um, which is a conglomeration of multiple agencies working together to create better places to live here in Prince George's County. What's DHCD's role in that? Our role in this is the same as other agencies to try to make an impact in, a, in an area. We're using all of our resources, everything from the Community Development Block Grant Program to the Home Program, all of which will make a difference. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. This brings us to the end of this edition of Telling Our Story in Prince George's County. I'm so grateful to Prince George's County State's Attorney Angela Also Brooks and Prince George's County Director of Housing and Community Development Eric Brown for being my guests on this program. Thanks to our viewers and the citizens of Prince George's County, I deeply appreciate your support of this program and the opportunity to share the great stories of Prince George's County. Telling our story here in Prince George's County is a production of the Prince George's County Council. I'm Council Chair Andrea Harrison and I am telling our story in Prince George's County.